All right, so um, today we're going to move from the matrix class. We're going to take a look at actually manipulating an image. So before you do that, we're going to use a few interfaces in this code. And I know that's something some of you have done with other classes with me. Mm, don't know if everybody has. But um, the, the punchline is they give us a way of separating what from how. We can specify what we need before we have to know how it's going to be done. So for example, all these phones have an interface. They're all different, but they all plug into the same system. Um, same thing with the car, right? Uh, I think I picked Ferrari for both of these because, you know, I don't know if, if if I was to pick one car to rent, I'd want to like that steering wheel is amazing. It's got the shifters on the. But anyways, anyway, that aside, the uh, Ferrari has a different set of components than say a Ford or a Chevy. But we can all drive the car with the wheel, gas, and the brake. The interfaces are really similar. Uh, so one of the interfaces you're going to run into is the digital picture one. Here's the short version of what's in that file so that you guys can uh, know what's accessible. So anything that implements a digital, a digital picture will have these available to you. We're going to specifically be looking at things like getting 2D arrays of pixels, setting the pixels, or querying a single pixel. But um, this, is, this is where we're going to live and breathe for this, the rest of this unit. And uh, again, another thing that's really uh, good about it is this last bullet down here it says, uh, you can talk on any phone you like, and you don't need to reprogram the entire phone <coughs> system. right? Like if Apple's newest iPhone came out, and they said, oh, we don't know about this one yet. We have to hardwire this phone into the system. That would be a problem. But instead, the phone company tells Apple, here's the interface you need to connect to, Apple. We don't care how you do it. Wow us with your incredible inventions. We don't care how you do it, but you have to plug into the phone system a certain way. So Apple's phone comes in, the two mesh together, and it doesn't matter whether it's a Motorola, an Apple, they still make Motorola's, I think, yeah? Okay, um, Android, whatever. They all connect on the same interface. So for Java, an interface, in case you haven't seen one, you just declare all the things. What do you need to do? How is up to the implementer. So if you, if you say you're gonna implement an interface, you have to define the method bodies there. Um, so a few things about it. You can't create an interface like this. You can't build a new digital picture. It doesn't exist. It is only a means of telling you what's available from a digital picture. But you can reference it. So I can make a picture, which is another class that we'll use, and then set it to a digital picture because it's an implementer. So in this way, you can have many different implementing classes, and you refer to them all with the one class. Um, you can also do this, by the way, this is another good note since some of you are getting really good at programming. Um, Java allows for abstract methods and classes. So if you know you have a bunch of things you'd actually like to code how it's implemented, but some things you just want to say what is necessary. So for example, um, one thing in graphics sometimes is done is you have a shape class. Everything that's drawn on screen is a shape. But I don't know exactly how to draw your shape because it could be anything, a circle, a square, whatever you like. So then I declare the method for drawing as abstract. So this would be the Java uh, syntax for an abstract drawing method. But that means I have to tell Java the class is also an abstract method. And the same rules apply now as the interface. You can initiate it. A subclass that extends it will be the one that actually um, is built and created with a constructor. So not that that part of it is necessary right now for you, but you're going to find that um, sometimes you don't want an entire interface, meaning there are no method bodies that, um, you know, it's just a declaration. Sometimes you want a combination, and this is how you do it in Java with the abstract keyword. So let's get into, right down into the image manipulation. Um, the first thing I want to do is, um, well, I guess I didn't really state this super clearly. Uh, we'll set the red channel of all pixels to zero. Yeah, I guess that's fine. We can do it that way. Um, so I'll zero out, if that makes sense, in your red, green, and blue channel. I'm going to pull every pixel out of the picture, and then I'm going to set its uh, um, value to zero for reds. But I'll leave the other two unchanged. So um, I have this NetBeans class that I'm going to fill in with you here. I'm going to show you it. Uh, some of these I'm going to have to blank out for now, just so we can compile it and you can see. Uh, 
Oops, and of course that's what I was looking for. Okay, so here's how it would work with a simple picture. Uh, the first thing that I'm gonna wanna do is get a 2D array of pixels. And I'll do that by getting um, from my image, the simple picture, I'll, I'll pull them from there. And now, if I'm gonna zero out the channel, I'm gonna build an image that's going to allow me to store the result. <coughs> and one type of picture that you can create, picture, I'm not very good at talking and typing, um, is to just build a blank image. So I'll create an image with the same width and the same height as uh, the original. So in this now, I'm gonna traverse through and basically destroy each of those uh, red channels. Um, and I believe this first time I'm gonna do it with uh, an enhanced for loop. Um, not that it's particularly useful in this instance, but just again, so you get some more practice using that. Um, so because it's a 2D array, that means the first loop is gonna pull an array out of that 2D arrays. Uh, maybe I'll call row of pixels is probably a better way of um, There we go as I mentioned uh, Not the strongest talker typer right now Okay, so the first row This is the 2d array here pixels and I'm gonna yank a single 1d array out of it and then in here I'll I'll deal with my columns now and I'll get each pixel from that row of <coughs> pixels all right um, so in this what I can do is create a new color which uh, you're gonna need to do a bit of an import I believe I already have um, so you got to take your color class in but I'll create this color. Um, what are we gonna call this? Uh, zero red. And you may need to look this up, but the way that it goes is RGBA. It goes red, green, blue, alpha. Alpha represents transparency. So I'm going to use that pixels uh, zero for the red. The pixels, sorry, it's just P that pixels green. And that pixels blue. And I don't want to, I don't think you'll run into a problem, but it's always best. We might as well preserve the alpha, but that's where you'd mess with its transparency. So now I have a pixel or I have a color with zero red in that channel. And now I'm gonna to go to that resulting picture and I'm gonna do a set pixel, let's see, set basic pixel. And this is X and Y, which uh, I kind of wish they didn't do this in the uh, lab. I, I kind of wish that instead they would have done it row column, like the same way we've been discussing. but. That's why it's flipped, because the columns move horizontally like X, and the rows would move vertically like Y. And this is how I'm going to call out that channel. So zero, whoops, zero red dot um, get RGB. So it'll take the color, and it'll construct it as an integer for me. And now, once it's burned through all that, I can uh, show you what this actually will do. So I have uh, a main method. I'll pull it up for us to, to play around with. Come back to that one later. So I have a simple picture called beach. I'm gonna make a new simple picture called uh, zero red. Oh, I'm sorry. I need a picture effect. That's what I called my class. 
So the picture effect I'm going to apply is zero red. To that. And now I'm going to say, um, give me that picture. And there's this method. It's going to be handy for you to see your work as it's in progress. Um, but you can do this explore, and it will pop up a window to show you your image. So here is a zero red, hopefully. Oh, one or more. Let's let's live dangerously. I have no picture. Where's the picture? All right, so that's better. That's what it will look like. And if you explore, you can click. And everywhere there, you can see the red channel here. It's still registering zero no matter where I go. So it's kind of surprising. It doesn't look like there's actually that much red in this picture to begin with. It's not you know, ridiculously different. So um, another goal that's in here is going to be to set the green and set the blue. So you can probably figure at this point that that sounds like a lot of copy and paste, which is pretty much exactly what I'm going to do um, before we talk about a smarter way, which requires a bit of color theory. OK, so zero green. And we need a zero blue. So I'll zero out green here. And then the next one, I will zero out the blue. OK, so let's go back to main, and I'll show you the different effect there, because I know you're all dying to see it. OK, so what does zero blue look like? That was a pretty nice looking blue beach. And it is now yellow. Remember, um, if you get rid of blue, you have red and green. And red and green together, remember what they make? You can probably guess what's the tinge to the screen. Yellow. Yellow, yeah. So in this one, the blue channel is zeroed. So it'd be similar for the green. You want to see it? I want to see it. <laughs> So what do you think the tinge is going to be this time? If you take the red out, you're left, or sorry, if you take the green out, you're left with red and blue. Do you know what red and blue makes? If all you have are shades of red and blue, you should see a purple, purple tinge. That's right. You didn't do enough finger painting, obviously. All right. So let's get uh, a better strategy here, because we can do much better than this. Um, before I need to do that, I need to show you this quick little magic trick here. So let's see, Sean, um, all I want you to do is pick a number for me and tell me what column it's in. So for example, if it was, um, I don't know, what is it, the number 20, I see the number 20 in A, I can see the number 20 in C, and I can't see it anywhere else. So pick a number and then let me know. Uh, Wait, you're not supposed to tell me the number. I'm going to tell you the number. So you can't pick 30. <laughs> but what you should have done is said A and B and C and that's oh and D. So what columns you got for me? I got E for you. Okay. That's it? Well, then you must have picked one. <laughs> well, that's too easy. Someone out here, Patrick, pick one. Sorry, C, D, and E? OK. So you picked seven, like lucky number, right? All right. Um, this isn't actually too much of a magic trick. Um, this has to do with the way computers store their ones and zeros. So first of all, we're going to show you a little bit to make your image manipulation uh, um, better than what we started at. Um, first of all, you need to know the AND, 
one and one is a one, everything else is zero. So zero and anything else, it'll blank it out to a zero. We're gonna use that when we go forward to knock out a channel. If we do zero and part of the channel, it'll knock everything else out to zero. Um, on the other hand, if we use or, zero or zero is the only way that you get a zero. Um, this is a one or anything gets you back to one. This is the same thing as when we would have said before, true or anything is true. Um, and false and anything is false. Um, <coughs> this is exclusive or, meaning one but not the other. So it's okay if one of them is, is lit up, so one and zero, or zero and one, but it can't be the other way. Uh, and this is how you negate with ones and zeros. This is how you store those 32 bits in memory. So the way it's recorded is you start with alpha for the first uh, eight bits. The next eight bits are red, then green, then blue. So if I want to zero out the red channel, what I could do instead is preserve all of the bits except these eight red bits that are there. If I take that number and I go and the pixel value, it will knock out the red channel for me the same way we did before. And similarly, this is how you light up the channel to be full. It would be with a one. And we're playing with just one mix here. You could mix this all around to get different effects. So uh, how does it work? Well, here's how you get the binary numbers. If you hadn't thought about the way this works, um, 1, 2, 3 and base 10 is 123. Because it's 100 plus 20 plus 3. That's the same thing as 1 times 10 squared plus 2 times 10 plus 3 times 10 to the 0. The same rule applies no matter what base you move into. So for example, this binary number, 1010, 0, 1, 0, that now is working with 8, 4, 2, and 1. So if I want to add that up, that's 1 times 2 cubed, 0 times 2 squared, 1 times 2 to the 1, and 0 times 2 to the 0. So I end up with the number 10. And if we go back to the magic trick, 10 only should appear then in 8 and 2. So if I look in these columns for B and D, I have a 10 and 10. But it doesn't appear anywhere else because literally it just maps the way binary numbers work into these columns. All right. So you're going to run into this uh, at some point. If you're doing this, you want to use hex because if you use binary, there's a lot of things to write out. And there's a way of accessing hex in Java, which is with this 0x prefix. So if you write a number like this, 0x, this means you're telling Java that you're writing a number in hexadecimal. Hexadecimal lets you go four at a time. So for example, instead of four ones, you use the number F. Weird, right? The number F. But it's because when you go from zero to F, that gives you 16 characters, which is hexa, as in hexadecimal, six, base 16. So uh, let me get to an example here, just so you can see. Um, but uh, this is the kind of thing that you would need to know for your exam. It might say something to you like, how many unsigned values are present with 16 bits? So if I give you, and I say, I don't have any signed numbers. They're all positives. How many can you make with 16 bits? So close, my friend. And I guarantee you they would have given you that as a, uh, a multiple choice. You are right about the number of... Um, um, Let's see here. Distinct combinations that can be made. But um, it's usually including a zero. So you would have that many minus one. For example, if I give you three bits, you can store eight characters. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So you're off by one because it's zero. Um, and if you have signed data, if I give you 32 bits, by the way, this is an integer in Java. This is why the AP exam would want you to know. Maybe you've never thought about it. What's the biggest integer you can make? Two to the power of sixteen means you only use sixteen of the bits. So let let's think let's think of it as simplistically. If I have positives and negatives, would it make sense for me to allocate half positive, half negative? Okay, that means I still have thirty-one bits left over. So I'd have thirty-one bits that tells me the magnitude and the one bit for the sign. So I would end up with two to the 31 minus one since I have to have a zero in there as well, okay? 
So now we can put them together and see how many colors are possible if you have 8-bit RGB. So that means RGB, how many bits are there going to be in total now? For each, but so if you have eight bits for red, green, and blue, how many in total do you have? You have a total of six, six, 24, bits. 24 bits. So two to the 24, this is how many yeah. unique uh, colors <laughs> that the computer can store. So it's about 1.7 million, 1.6. So maybe when you buy a TV and they brag about how many colors they can make, this is literally all they're telling you, right? That they're just saying, uh, we have eight bits in each RGB channel. And if you want to go up higher, I don't even know that the human eye starts to distinguish them beyond that. But you can certainly pay a lot more for a TV if you want to. Um, by the way, if you test this out, you may not get the values you expect. If you try to print some hex numbers, um, this is not all ones lit up the way you think. Uh, there's a tricky system that uh, uh, is used to represent these numbers. So I'm only telling you this not because you need to know it, but in case you fool around um, and plug these numbers in. Um, it doesn't work the way you might expect. And uh, this is, I'll let you look at it later, but for your own purposes, just know that um, everything is accurate, but you may not expect the way that negative numbers are stored by a computer um, works the way they do. So let's get back to masking an image because that was the point of doing a quick little bit of color theory with you. Um, so with these operators, I'm going to do the AND mask for you. Um, here's the other bitwise operators. You can make your own masks, which is one of the assignments coming up. So we can do a lot more than just zero out a single channel. So I'm going to go back to my uh, code now. And I'm going to make a method that will uh, do an AND mask for me. So let me grab this here. And what I want is someone will give me the mask that they're going to be using. And I will then check to see that it's been applied. So everything is exactly the same as it was before. I'm not a big fan of that, uh, that name there. Let's call this, um, I'll call that uh, pixel color. So all I'm going to do now is apply the bitwise operator in Java. That's single and. And I'm going to apply that to the mask. So this will apply the mask. And I can do all of the methods I've already shown you. And I can do way more by messing around with the, the hexadecimal. So here I'm going to call this um, and mask. And um, four bits at a time, I get uh, alpha channel. Let's go like this, 0x alpha channel, leave it alone. Then I'll go zero out the red, let's zero out the green too, and keep the blue. So now this, is, this would be like saying, you may leave blue alone. Oops, apparently I've, uh, I just called it mask. Okay, so this is gonna apply that mask bitwise to the color pixel. And it's only going to have the blue channel. Mm. <coughs> Better go have a quick look at my code there for a sec. All right, so just to jog your memory here, this is what, oops, sorry, I got a conflict there. Um, this is what it used to look like when we zeroed out the red. So just so you can see that it does the same thing, it's a very blue picture, much more blue tint to it. And then now what I'm going to do is use the mask instead. And um, so it goes uh, red, green, sorry, alpha. And then it's going to be red, green, blue. So it's a much bluer picture that we're hoping for this time. And there it is. So the reason that one method is convenient is you can mask it with you know, just about anything. Let me see here. One, two, three, four. Here's the blue mask gone. 
So now I have red and green. This was the yellow uh, tint to it. But I can do them all through one method and masking. And you can also mess around and try it, like what happens if I was to use, say, um, uh, the or mask or the bitwise uh, exclusive or, or negate them. Um, we should go check out, let's just see what happens if we take only the red channel. So if I have only the red channel, this is the one I think I tried to start with where I found my, uh, my mistake there. Kind of neat, I guess, eh? but uh, a pure red picture. So um, hopefully this gives you some sense. And again, I'll, I'll, my code will be there for you to kind of follow along. But for your turn, you have to make three picture effects. So there's a whole bunch of suggested to you. If you can think of a cooler one, I'd love to hear it. Um, but these are the differences, and I'll let you read them on your own time. Um, but pick three of those to show me that you can apply a picture effect. Um, now, next task, a vertical mirror. So this time I'm going to manip manipulate the image so that it goes from this happy little caterpillar to this uh, happy little Siamese caterpillar, right? Siamese twin, no? Yeah, OK. Anyways. It's uh, got a, a vertical mirror on the image. So a vertical mirror will be placed right down the center. And I'll bring it up in Java so you can see the way that the code would go there. So maybe, again, if you think of your own picture effect, maybe this will uh, give you some inspiration. OK, so public simple picture um, vertical mirror. And I don't actually need a parameter this time because I'm just going to mirror it right off the vertical. And I am going to want to keep track of the rows and columns here. And oh, and of course, so the rows is the height of the image, and the columns is the width of the image. And the center, if I'm putting a vertical line in, <laughs> It's the horizontal that I actually want to mess with. So I want to mess with the columns. So I'm going to call this the center. And I'm going to do a little bit of integer manipulation. So um, do you remember how this works when you divide integers? What's 5 divided by 2 is integers? 2. Yeah, it hucks the decimal. So what I want to make sure, and that's the reason I have this math here, is that I always end up in the middle, so I mirror it properly. So for example, if I have five pixels, and I can use my hand for that, I want to make sure that the mirror is right in the center of my hand. So if I don't use five, that means I'm going to be using four. Take one away. Divide by two is two. That puts me at zero, one, two, right on the middle of my finger right there. OK, that works now for the odd numbers. If I try it with an even number, like four, 4 divided by, or sorry, 4 minus 1 is 3. Then 3 divided by 2 is 1. 0, 1. So it's gotten to the middle because it'll be mirrored. The other side will be used as part of the mirror. So you can verify my math later there, but uh, the math is actually uh, needed to make sure I, I mirror it properly. But the standard task you're going to be operating on here is to get your 2D pixels. And now we'll, uh, we'll loop through them. This time I'm not going to do the uh, uh, enhanced for loop. Sorry, it would be columns and then rows, width and height. And I'll just use a standard counter loop. Now, it's a little different uh, when we do the columns, because we want to stop at that center line. Remember, if it's the odd position, I don't need to mirror that, that middle one, because it's already done. I only need to do it to the, uh, the middle. So let's see here, C++. And this is the uh, int. This is its mirrored column. So if you're on column C, the mirror is going to be however many columns you have minus whatever value you're on and take one away. 
So again, you can verify the math, but really quickly, if I hold up my 10 fingers, index 9, that's index 9 for you, I guess, right? Um, should be mirrored with 0. So I should go 9 minus, uh, or sorry, 10 columns, minus 9, minus 1, gets me to mirror with 0. Um, so you can check that they actually do mirror to each other. Um, and I'm going to grab that pixel value. It's equal to pixels, row, column. Oops. So now I have the integer value, and this is the one that I'm going to set for the result. <coughs> result dot set basic pixel. And remember, it's weird that it's x and y, so you may find yourself doing this as well. To uh, you got to switch the column row. And I'm also going to do this where it's mirrored. So this is going to be the mirror column now. So then once it burns through that mirror, I can return the result. So we'll go check it out in the beach. This time I'll say vertical mirror this. And that beach picture, which is probably, well, it's not raining today, I guess, but uh, I'm sure it makes you feel like uh, taking a vacation. Um, there is the mirrored image of this, um, of this beach. All right. Go back to my code. Yes, and that white line is because as I was explaining it to you, it was actually supposed to be a plus that was the offset. So in that particular image, it came back to bite me, but at least in this one, you can see it visually if you've done it correctly. So hopefully, fingers crossed, there we go. There's no white line down the middle because I didn't miss that additional uh, a slot. OK, I'll get rid of the one there. So um, I'll do the, the horizontal mirror with you as well. It's uh, very similar, so I'll do a copy-paste here. And I'll make the adjustments this time. So this time I'm going to call it an H mirror. And it's the rows that I want to work on. So the rows, it's going to be very similar. Rows go here. And it's the center now. I don't go past the center row, but I do use all of the columns. And here, I might as well call this the mirror row. It will be the rows minus whatever row I'm on, minus 1. And column gets to go all the way through, but row and mirror row are the ones I'm going to use. So um, we can verify it, just to see it visually. I realize that that's very fast, but it's analogous to what we just did on the vertical mirror. So you can scan through that code later, but you can have a look at what a horizontal mirror does. So that's tops and bottom. Okay. So those are like your kind of guidelines, the vertical and the horizontal, what I did for what you need to do, which is flip vertical. Um, so basically, if I'm holding a sheet of paper, just to make it, I guess, uh, easy for you to see, this is the flip vertical. So that's what your pixels will do. The top pixels go to the bottom. The bottom pixels go to the top. It's just a flip, OK? And vertical, because that's the motion of the pixels. Again, if I'm holding this picture and I show you flip horizontally, it goes like that, OK? Um, and then rotate means you're going to take the picture like this. You only need to worry about 90 degrees. So now you have a new image like that. So again, I'm giving you a little bit of hints here. The rows become the columns. So when you create your empty image to fill, you need to swap those because you're, you're rotating 90 degrees. OK? All right. Now, this takes us to the cool part. <laughs> um, the part where once you've gotten some familiarity with manipulating your images, this will be actually like a, a something that we really would spend time on, um, which is transitions. So does anybody know what a transition is? Kind of? So I've got some examples for you. But um, I'm going to show you the dissolve uh, transition and how I did it. 
and we're going to use um, a little bit of an interface that I've put up. So I'll show you these and then we'll code it. So first of all, I'm giving you this class called a transition maker. Um, you can, you're expected to use this. You, this will make the transitions for you as long as you create the right picture effect. So it could be a picture effect where the red channel grows or something like that. But uh, you have to define how this works and, and I'll give you an example. Um, and the way you do that is through the image blender. It's, a transition is when two images are blended until one takes over. So this is the interface. There is only one um, method required and that is that you be able to produce an image which reflects the current percentage that's passed. So if you tell me 50 percentage passed, maybe half the image is showing right now. 75, it'd be three quarters of the image. 100, it's fully overlapped. So by 100%, your transition is done. So dissolve is the one I'm going to do with you here. And um, I uh, thought about how I wanted to design this, but yours is going to look very similar. You won't need this pixel sequence unless you do something similar. But you're going to want to store the original picture. Oops. So I have uh, a field there, original equals the original that I use in my constructor. And the next image in the sequence will be the upcoming one. Now I need to produce this image. And I'll show you the dissolve is like where it's sort of just like, uh, you'll see it when I run it. But basically, it kind of like um, pixels are randomly selected to be removed and, and, and pushed through to the front. So that's what I want to do with this pixel sequence. And there's a little bit of math. This is what I want to do is I want to straighten the two-dimensional picture. So rather than have a row and a column, I'm going to give it one long line. So imagine if I took every row and I put it end over end and had just one long single array. Um, this is how I could find uh, the position for each thing in there. And that's what I'm going to manipulate. So let's uh, first I'll get this random sequence going here so you can see it. My pixel sequence. <coughs> is a new integer array. But inside, what I'm going to use is the original image get width times the original image get height. And uh, I, it says in the slides, but you can assume that you don't need to worry about what if the two images are different s sizes. That's not a problem we'll worry about. Typically, we would just pad the smaller image with black pixels just to uh, fill the gap. But it's not necessary that you do that. So here's the first step. I'm just going to fill this array now with its index value. Uh. Okay, so I'm going to take this pixel sequence and <laughs> I'm going to fill the array so that everyone has a place in it. Now, this represents every possible spot in the picture, but I wanted to shuffle it. That's what I'm going to do next is I'm going to shuffle the array. And you can shuffle it for as long as you like. I'm just going to do one pass of the array. So in this, I'm going to say I need to save the target value. Um, I'm going to get a random index and swap them. So I'll call on math.random here to do this with me. That, by the way, is the advanced placement um, method of preference. So for random numbers, if you use any utility classes, expect to see math.random used. So this just gave me some random index. Now I'm just going to shuffle that index with someone else. OK, so let's go to pixel sequence at k. <laughs> and now I will overwrite that. Pixel sequence 
at um, the target. No, yes, target. And now I will put it back pixel sequence at that target is the temp. So I filled it up in a predictable sequence. I just shuffled everybody around so that that way it'll look like it's a random dissolving of the picture. So now I have everything I need built for when this transition starts. And to blend the two together now, I'm gonna access both um, pixel arrays. So let's call this the original pixels. And I'm gonna need another array. Um, I'll call it the upcoming image. And that's this next one's get pixels. Oops. Okay, so I'll store up uh, the columns because I'll be using that in my calculation. And this is going to be my result, a simple picture uh, that is being blended. And remember, you're not responsible for dealing with the case that they have different uh, dimensions. Um, but here's basically the way this transition will, will fly. Um, uh, I need to stop based on the percentage of the array that you want me to implement. So the last value I'll be looking for will be when I take the... Um, percentage that you've given me right up here. So if you tell me it's 10% done, it'll be percentage, that's to blend, times this pixel sequence dot length. So how far along, in my transition, it depends. If it goes all the way through the array, it's completely <coughs> switched the image. So this one, if you only want to do 10%, you go through 10% of the array. So I just need two loops now to swap the images. One that takes, uh, first moves the original pixels over. So that means I'm gonna go um, get me a target, which will be at pixel sequence index n. And now, if I want to know what's the target row, this is that bit of math that I was uh, alluding to earlier. Um, it's the target divided by the columns. And the target column, where I'm going to put it back, is the target mod um, columns. So I know now that in this blended image, I'm going to set a pixel. So set basic pixel at the target row and target, oh, sorry, it's X and Y, so I gotta go X target um, row. And I want it to be um, from the, this time I'm moving it over from the upcoming image. And I need its RGB value. Oh, and I need to get the color, sorry. OK, so now what I've just done is I've taken the uh, upcoming image and I've shuffled some of it in based on the percentage of the picture you want me to do this to. And this time, I'm just going to, whatever's left over, uh, 
I'll start at the last pixel and I'll go the rest of the way through the array. And it's identical process, but now I'm going to pull it from the um, original image. So instead of this one, I'm going to call this one the original image. And at this point, uh, I can return this blended one and show you what this transition actually does. And I'd already had it queued up here for you, so let me just... So there's a picture of a motorcycle that I'm going to blend with that beach picture. <laughs> And it's going to do it with um, five frames that are 100 uh, milliseconds apart. So it's only going to run a half second animation here. And, um, but it's going to give me an animated GIF on my desktop, I believe is where I put it. So frame one. I just did this because it was quite annoying. It takes a while to manipulate that image, especially depending on, ah, there we go. So here's my image, and if I open this, what I did was I started with the beach. I think QuickTime does a, uh, Explorer can do it. It'll show the frame by frame that takes you from the beach to the motorcycle. It plays it twice when you open it in Internet Explorer. It's, so it fades from one to the other, so it dissolves from one into the other. So that's what you'll be doing. Um, I'll just show you real quick the other options that you have. So for example, you need to do two. Here's a push. It slides that one off the screen where the red box would represent what's on stage. Here's an uncover. It slides off and leaves the other image there. Um, cover, you can only do one of those two since they're so similar. Um, this is the clock. Not as bad as it looks. It's actually pretty simple. I'll help you with the math. Squares and several others that I'll let you have a look through. But you're responsible for doing two of them on your own. 